you here for the class? Great, can I see you on my seat real fast? Perfect. That's all I need. Cool. There's coffee over here if you want it. Tea too. Uh huh. I just started a scrap project there. Okay. in it your works. home. All I need is some water. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Patrick, what's your 20? Hey, I see you. My advice, just from the experience, <laughs> is don't do it inside. No, <laughs> it totally would have gone well. Not to put two cases because I didn't know if one wouldn't be sure. So just do one. Maybe case. one. Hope for it or get, just buy one that we know is for sure. Sure. Water. <laughs> and just like make sure you actually have bugs in there. <laughs> Food. Yeah. Everything needs food, water, shelter. <laughs> hey, Sam, Mr. Free, can you come to Cacti Succulent? I'll be right there. We can back stock stuff. Yeah, that's what I was talking okay. about. Like, yeah, no, we can back it. As long as everything's represented out here, um, stuff yeah, can be back stocked. Yeah. Perfect. Hi, Sam. Oh. So, this was Shine it. Radio Land, I'm going to go ahead and get the class started. Uh, cashiers, if we have any late arrivals, please check their ticket, their receipts at the registers and send them on back. I will be on radio silent from this point forward. If y'all are working out at the dock, please keep your voices down um, so it doesn't bleed through to the classroom. Heather, are you good? Or we are perfect up here. Sounds good. Yeah. 
Okay, hi everybody. Welcome, welcome. Um, we are going to have so much fun in this bugs class today. Uh, my name's Claire. I'm the general manager here at Garden 17. Um, I am also a uh, licensed wildlife rehabilitator and a Texas master naturalist, so I do quite a bit in the natural world as far as learning and observing and trying to help in any way I can. Um, I freaking love insects. They are one of my favorite things. They are so resilient and efficient. It's just inspiring. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, just kind of as a reminder, this class is for y'all. Don't hesitate to ask questions. I may say, hey, I'm about to get to that topic. We'll address it in a minute, but we will address and answer every single question that y'all will have. Um, if you need to get up and go to the restroom, by all means do it. It's just right out this door. Take a hard right. You're there. There's a water fountain. We've got coffee and tea up here. Don't hesitate to move around. I have a bad back, so if you need to stand up for a minute, I will not judge anything. So this class is for y'all. Um, kind of the overview of today's class. So we're going to talk about true bugs. Um, this is kind of a very technical definition. Um, roles of insects in the ecosystem, again, very, very important, so we're going to touch on that. Um, beneficial insects, we're going to talk a lot about beneficial insects today. Um, can't talk about beneficials without talking about the plant damaging insects. Um, and then how to treat your garden, how to really mm -hmm. provide a diverse ecosystem so that your plants do better and so that you are not constantly fighting something all the time because that's not fun. If you're not getting joy out of gardening and plants, then find another hobby. I mean, I want everyone to love plants, but they bring me joy. And it, when they don't bring me joy, they're out of there and I find something that does. Um, okay, so true bugs. A true bug has multiple anatomical definitions. The biggest one being they have piercing and sucking mouth parts. Um, there's also some wing anatomy classification as well as um, thorax anatomy definition. Um, but we're going to kind of stick to that piercing and stu uh, sucking mouth parts as far as what we consider a true bug. Um, all insects are bugs, not all bugs are insects, because again, we have this weird true bug definition in there. Um, true bugs, they can be predatory, they can be parasitic, they can be beneficial, they can run the gamut of everything that we expect a bug to do. Um, our most recognizable true bug is going to be aphids. Everyone's dealt with aphids. Um, they have that perfect piercing and sucking mouth part to suck that phloem, which is that sap out of the plant, um, and use it as its nutrition. Um, we also have an assassin bug. This is another true bug. Assassin bugs are highly beneficial. Um, they are very predatory, um, so anytime you see an assassin bug, let it do its thing, let it assassinate some things. Um, and then cochineal scale, I'm sorry, this is so fuzzy. Um, cochineal, you most often find this on prickly pear cactus. If you see kind of that white fuzzy on a prickly pear paddle, if you squish it, it turns bright red. That was actually one of the historical first red dyes that humans use for clothing, for all kinds of stuff. So, but that is a true bug. It has a piercing, sucking mouth part, and it's called, it's in the family of scale. So they usually attach to the plant. They build like a protective shell around them so that they're less likely to be predated. Um, and then they just feed on, on the plant host. Um, again, I'm really sorry that's so fuzzy. Um, because they really are cool. Um, I'm not a big fan of squishing things for no reason, but the cochineal, it really is impressive how red that is. Um, so if you feel like squishing something, it's probably not the worst thing to squish. Um, okay, role of insects in the ecosystem. Without insects, 
we would be in a far different world than we know now. Um, insects are really responsible for a lot of organic matter decomposition. Um, without them, our leaves wouldn't break down, our soil wouldn't break down, compost would not exist. Um, so just for the kind of foundation soil level, insects are mandatory. You can't have healthy soil without a bunch of insects, both good and bad. Um, they play a vital role in pollination. Um, there were some folks in here for the pollinator class. Um, pollination does tend to be accidental. Um, these plants have produced nectar to entice bugs to them as kind of an accidental happy accident. The insects come in to eat the nectar. They then take the pollen from one flower to the other. So pollination really is kind of an accidental thing, um, but the flowers have developed this with the insects so that we can get fruit, we can get vegetables, we can get food. Um, very, very interesting. Um, we can see uh, this little beetle just covered in pollen. He's about to go to a different flower and pollinate that flower so that we can get some seeds off of that. Um, organic matter decomposition, this is just a really quick, very brief chart. It is one of the most complicated <laughs> things that you could ever start learning about. Um, there are so many layers to decomposition of organic material. We could talk about that for 10 hours straight and still barely scratch the surface. Um, but essentially, plant matter, leaves, dead plants, etc., fall to the ground, bacteria, protozoa, um, insects, all kinds of fungi help to break that down into a usable nutrition substrate for new plants. Does that kind of track? Okay, I'm throwing some really like, this is a little nitty gritty stuff, <laughs> but that's the fun stuff. And then so many things rely on bugs to eat, you know, um, even seed eating birds. So this is, I believe it's a sparrow species. As an adult, they eat nothing but seeds. As babies, they need to be fed insects because protein, nutrition, all of that. So even animals that we don't think rely on insects to survive, they really do. Um, again, even if they weren't feeding the insects to their young, these birds are still going to rely on insects to help break things down so that we can have seed production so that they do have something to eat. Um, and biodiversity, like the more diverse selection of plants and animals, insects, everything that you can have, the healthier an ecosystem you're going to have overall. Um, I grew up with the um, adage that if something's not eating your garden, you're not really part of the system. Um, and that's kind of what I run with. Uh, every time I see a caterpillar, I'm like, I'm part of the system. I got this. Um, okay, beneficial insects. This is really fun. Yeah. Um, okay, so we, I use all kinds of beneficial insects in my yard. Um, the green lacewing, y'all, I'm sure y'all have all seen the adults. They're these teeny tiny little lime green flying insects with almost transparent wings. Um, the adult stage is very brief and it is literally just to mate and lay eggs. The larval stage though, highly predatory. I have seen lacewing larvae strip an entire, probably three foot tall milkweed plant of aphids in a matter of minutes. It is impressive. Um, so when you're looking at lacewings, you're gonna, you're really looking for the larval stage. That's what's gonna be the predatory stage. Um, the lacewing eggs, so you'll see these kind of laid on different plants. They're laid on long, tall filaments with a single egg at the end of each filament at the top. So they kind of look like little columns with a little ball on top. That's done for multiple reasons. That keeps the egg up off of the plant and less likely to be predated by something that might be crawling on the plant. 
These guys can also be very cannibalistic. As soon as they hatch, they are hungry, they are ready to eat. So if the lacewing was to lay all of her eggs together in a ball, probably half of them would eat the other half. So they have evolved this system of laying eggs so that their offspring have a better chance of surviving just the hatching process. Super interesting. Um, this is a ladybug larva. I don't know if anybody has ever seen ladybug larva in their garden. I swear every science fiction movie, every monster movie comes from larval stage of insects or some kind of deep sea creature. I'm convinced. Like that is where all of the inspiration comes from. Um, we can see that this little ladybug larva is eating, has a mouthful of aphids right there. Um, again, highly predatory, will strip a plant of aphids very, very quickly. Um, hi, come on in. Um, so the ladybug larva um, are probably a third to half an inch at the biggest. Um, I've only seen them about half an inch right before they start to pupate into the adult stage. Um, they're bigger than a ladybug, than a full-grown ladybug. And that's not uncommon for insects. Um, larval stages do tend to be bigger than their adult stages. Think about a caterpillar. Um, you know, there's some caterpillars out there that are three and four times bigger than the adult ca uh, butterfly or moth or whatever. Um, that is that is kind of par for the course with insects. So we do expect their larval stages to be a little bit bigger. Um, but so if we're seeing this little crazy dinosaur, yellow, black, stripy guy in your garden, don't squish it, doing you a favor. But it's really cool. And kind of watch where it goes because it will eventually pupate and it will become a, an adult ladybug. Um, and then of course there's the mantis. So lace wings and ladybugs are really, really great at taking care of our little things, our aphids, our mealybugs, our spider mites, things like that. For our bigger things like grasshoppers, so I have a ton of canna lilies. They're one of my favorite plants. They're super easy. I can neglect it. They flower all summer. Love it. However, grasshoppers love it just as much as I do. Um, so I release mantis in my yard probably twice a month. Um, they are really going to be our biggest predator of larger plant damaging insects than anything else because they are just bigger themselves. Um, there's no way a ladybug larva could eat this grasshopper. It would probably be the other way around. Um, so mantis, A, they're really cool. I've seen one catch a hummingbird, which is pretty... You know, it's one of those, who do I root for? I really, you know, I love the hummingbirds and I, uh, they play such a vital role too, but then the mantis needs to eat. So it's, it's really one of those, I hope everyone lives, <laughs> but I know someone's gotta die in order for the other to live. Um, but mantis are really going to be most effective on our larger plant damaging insects. Um, so it's always really important to have them. Sure. Uh-huh. And I took them out. Okay. I haven't seen anything yet. Okay. It looks like there should be something happening inside there. So have you looked? So the question that for that, if anybody didn't hear, you've had it out for about five days. or I've had it out for longer. You've had it out for longer and you haven't seen anything happening? Okay. So it may have already happened and you may have missed it. So the pouches in here, they are not going to be on the filaments like this. So essentially what happens is these are bred to be sold as beneficial insects. So when these are packaged, they are removed from these long filaments and put in the substrate. So these aren't all eggs. The eggs are teeny tiny. Um, so you're really not going to see them in here. So it may have already happened. Have you... Well, that's going to depend. So just like everything, insects need food, water, and shelter. If they hatch and there's no food available, there's no water available, and or there's no shelter available, they're going to move on. 
they're gonna go find a place that has all of those resources available. So if you're putting something out and you don't have an active plant damaging insect issue, they're gonna move on to somewhere that does. So it may have happened and there just may not have been the resources there to encourage them to stay there. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Sure. Last year, the aphids on the crepe myrtles were yeah. unbelievable. I've got three giant crepe myrtles in my yard, and there was no combating it. I just was like, okay, you're either going to live or you're not, and I'm not fighting with you but anymore. I haven't seen any aphids yet, but so that could very well be it. That could be they did indeed hatch but because there wasn't anything there for them to eat, they're going to move on to a place that does have those resources. So, um, Could you wait so that's a good question. The question was, should we wait until we start seeing a problem? I don't. I use this as a preventative. I, throughout spring and really into fall, I'm putting both lacewing and praying mantis out about twice a month whether I'm seeing anything at all or not. I can guarantee I've got some pests in my garden. I'm a lazy gardener. I do very, very little. I rely on these guys to do most of the work for me. Um, I also have water sources um, and shelter available. So uh, that's a big thing. Again, just like us, food, water, shelter. Those are basic things for survival. Um, so if you're putting them out before you see a problem, I wouldn't be so concerned with them not actually hatching, I would be thinking, oh, I probably just don't have a plant damaging insect problem right now. Um, again, not a bad thing to go ahead and do. Yeah. 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 Well, then wait until you have an issue. Um, you know, just time it differently next time. Um, wait until you're actually seeing some of those plant damaging insects. Go ahead and get the, the beneficial bugs out and then, again, you're providing them with the food. Make sure there's a water source available for them. That could be as simple as a shallow saucer full of water. Um, plants provide the shelter, so you don't really need to worry about that, but just make sure that there's food and water available. Um, again, I'm not gonna wait to see a problem. I'm just gonna get them out there and hope for the best. Um, so that could very well be it. Let's talk a little more after the class. I would just open, so what I often do when I'm changing out packets, um, I'll just peel this apart and just spread this on my soil. I mean, this is like, but if it's been up there a couple weeks, it's I would just take it out and empty it out mm -hmm. and go from there and maybe wait until you see something and then start over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, any other questions on that? Yes. We did briefly touch on them. So they are considered a true bug and they are highly predatory. So assassin bugs are great. You want them around. Okay, so, okay, so yeah, so the question was um, insects and disease transfer. That's everywhere, unfortunately. Um, lots and lots of bugs are zoonotic, which means that they can transfer disease to us. They can transfer disease to, zoonotic is really specific to humans, but they could transfer it to, to pets. I would definitely, um, identify very solidly what assassin bugs you're actually seeing in your environment and make sure that those are on the the safe list um, you know it could just be if you know that they're always centered in this very specific area just keep the dogs away from that area um, you know if you're always seeing them on your pepper plants keep the dogs away from the peppers um, that kind of thing um, pepper plants can be very prone to aphids which is probably why you're seeing assassin bugs there and not seeing aphids because 
the assassin bugs are eating the aphids. Um, so I would just, I would do a little bit of identification um, as far as what specific species of assassin bug you're seeing and just double check that it's going to be safe for you and for your, your animals. Um, I am not encouraging anybody to go and just pick up random bugs. <laughs> I'm just gonna put that out there right now. Um, there are lots of bugs that can carry diseases that can be very, very um, dangerous and lethal to us and other animals. So identify what you're seeing before you touch it. That's the best advice I can give you. Um, the Texas A&M, the AgriLife Extension, has a great Texas insect identification guide. Um, I consult it all the time. Um, we also have to remember that we are dealing with um, kind of global migration. So we see a lot of insects here in our area that really shouldn't be here. Um, that's one of the biggest reasons Garden 17 will not carry ladybugs is because of the chance of getting a non-native lady beetle species mixed in with those ladybugs and then all of a sudden we've introduced a non-native invasive species to our area and nothing can combat it. So that's one of the biggest, any t if you are finding ladybugs and that's the route you wanna go down, check your sources, call the company, make sure that you are doing your legwork to prevent introducing those non-native, um, potentially invasive species, because they will outcompete our native beneficial ladybugs. And lots of them can be disease hosts. Um, so biggest reason that we're not gonna carry ladybugs here, if you ever ask us about it, that's the biggest reason why. Um, green lace wings and praying mantis are native to our area. We know that we're not introducing something that shouldn't be here, um, but be careful with ladybugs. Um, because again, we're in a global ecosystem essentially at this point with shipping and, you know, from I can get something sent over here from India, you know, tomorrow, who knows what's going to be in it. Um, so just be careful. It does take a little bit of work if you're doing some of this stuff, a little bit of your own research. Um, my other advice that I can give when you are doing online research there's a lot of great information out there, y'all. There is a lot of really bad, dangerous information out there. I, tr I tend to trust websites that end in .edu, .org, or .net before I'm gonna trust some random blog that I'm finding on the internet somewhere. The EDU is typically a university or some kind of school that has done research um, same thing with .org. Those are usually nonprofits that have some kind of research-based evidence. Same thing with .net. So when you're doing your, your, you know, Googling, those are the websites that I immediately go to. I'm not going to go to a .com because I don't really know the background. I'm less likely to find research-based evidence on those websites. Okay, does that cover that? Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so plant damaging aphids. So we're going to talk about some aphids. They are crazy. Um, when I talked about how efficient insects are, this is one of my best examples. Um, so <laughs> they have multiple reproduction cycles. They can be either sexual or asexual reproducing. Um, they can also overwinter their eggs. So the aphids that we saw in fall in our crate myrtles, um, I can guarantee you there are aphid eggs on every single one of those trees waiting for the perfect opportunity to hatch. Um, really unbelievable. They can also give birth to live young those live young are birthed pregnant. What? Yeah, yeah, so I'm gonna say that again. Um, so in the fall and the winter, the aphids are going to lay eggs so that they can overwinter, emerge in the spring. When those emerge in the spring, they are already pregnant because they can do asexual reproduction. They give birth to live young, which in turn are pregnant. I know, it's insane. 
it's insane. Um, I tried to get a video up here. I actually have a video of aphids giving birth like to a live pregnant aphid. It's kind of the coolest thing ever, and I'm really sorry that I couldn't get it up here. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, uh, and when I, t exactly, and uh, this is an amazing survival strategy. I mean, amazing survival strategy. This means that aphids have coverage in your garden year round, whether you know it or not. Um, Yep, 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 honeydew. Oh my, like, oh. It's like the sweetest word for bug poop, honeydew. Like so if you ever hear someone referring to honeydew that's not the fruit that is said in the same sentence with aphid, that is actually the poop that aphids are pooping out because literally all they eat is the sap from the plants. It's all sugar. Um, fire ants have been known to tend to aphid colonies because they in turn eat the honeydew. Um, so a lot of times if you're having a big aphid problem, I also encourage folks to start looking around their yards for fire ants because if you have an aphid infestation, I bet you're going to have fire ants pretty close to that aphid infestation that is actively protecting the aphids because they are a food source. Super crazy, super crazy. I've seen ants carrying aphids. Yeah, just like a ranch. <laughs> yeah, yeah they're, it's exactly like a ranch. It's, they're farming aphids, essentially. Um, mosquitoes are another one that will take advantage of aphid honeydew. Um, mosquitoes, I broke everyone's heart in the pollinator class. Mosquitoes are pollinators, y'all. Um, the female only needs blood. There's a protein in blood that the female needs for egg development. Males are strictly nectar eating. So you're welcome. A redeeming qua fact about mosquitoes. Um, so aphids are very, very important in the environment. Not only fire ants will, will kind of farm these guys, um, a lot of our very beneficial native ants will farm these guys too. Um, so if you are dealing with an ant aphid farming situation, make sure you're identifying the ant before you kill everything um, because we do want to make sure that we're only killing fire ants and we're not killing our native ant species of which there are literally hundreds um, that play a very vital role in our ecosystem. Um, so you're welcome. Pregnant babies, uh, babies having babies is the best definition for that. Uh, mealybugs, so if anybody does tropicals, um, there are a handful of uh, outdoor plants that can be very prone to mealybugs. Coleus is a big one. Um, I've never had a coleus that I didn't have a mealybug problem with at some point. Um, they are these like soft-bodied little fuzzy things. Uh, they're kind of cute. I know I'm a little biased. Um, but we see this a lot in our plant damaging insect category. And then squash vine borers. I don't know how many folks have had this fun experience. <sighs> squash vine borers are literally the reason that I do not do squash, pumpkin, watermelon at all anymore. It's just not worth the fight because to treat these guys, you have to use a systemic which when we're talking about treatments, once a systemic is part of the plant, it is part of the plant. There is no rinsing it off. There is no getting it out of there. It is in literally every single part of the plant. It's in the vine, it's in the roots, it's in the leaves, it's in the pollen, it's in the nectar, it's in the petals, it is everywhere. So I value my pollinators very, very highly. Um, I'm not going to use a systemic in my garden bed ever because even if there's a teeny tiny chance that it could affect my bees or my butterflies, it's not worth it. I'd rather just not do squash anymore. See me after class if you still really want to. Uh, we can go over some things, but squash vine borers, literally why I do not do these plants anymore. It's just the fight is almost unwinnable. Um, but that's what they look like inside. So the adult will actually lay the egg. They'll pierce the stem of the squash. They will lay the egg inside. The egg will hatch. 
This is the larval stage. They literally eat the plant from the inside out, um, leaving you with very little production for yourself. Um, again, highly efficient survival strategy. Can't fault them for that. Um, they're hidden from predators. They're, you usually don't know you have them until it's too late. Yes? Is there insects that will control the plant? Yep. Kind of all of these guys will, with the exception of squash borers. Um, because the squash borers live inside the plant exclusively, um, they're not going to do a lot of damage to surrounding plants unless it's another squash, watermelon, pumpkin, something like that, that the adult insect has also laid eggs in. Um, mealybugs, aphids, spider mites, all very transferable to other plants. So we're going to get into some um, troubleshooting and preventative here in a minute. I've got some plants in here that are notoriously prone to some things, so we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But yeah, most of these guys, with the exception of the squash borers, are going to transfer very easily to other things. Um, so that is, that's a great question. Okay, how to treat. Um, my biggest thing is beneficial insects. You cannot have beneficial insects without bad insects. I remind myself this all the time. This is likely why you're not seeing any lacewing larva, is you didn't have any of the plant damaging insects for the beneficial insects to, to stick around. So if all you're doing is treating your space with, um, insecticides for the bad bugs, you will never ever see the good ones. So again, this goes into biodiversity. You can't have good without bad. There will always be something eating your plants. Unfortunately, that is part of plant, of plant parenthood. Um, there will always be yellow leaves. There will always be something eating your plants. It's a live thing that is supporting other live things. So um, that doesn't mean let aphids take over. That doesn't mean throw away anything that has a mealy bug on it, but do understand that this is a cycle and it can be stopped and it can be prevented to a certain extent, but you will always have some kind of insect issue inside, outside, whatever. Um, Non-systemic, so I touched on that briefly. Um, basically what a systemic is, is it's a treatment that is applied to the plant and the entire plant takes it up into every single part of it. Um, I like to describe it as systemics are like taking oral antibiotics. Other treatments, topical treatments are like using Neosporin on a cut. So you're topically treating the issue versus putting it inside the organism where every single piece of the organism is going to be exposed to that insecticide. Um, tropicals, I don't hesitate to use systemics in because I'm not growing them for flowers. These are not pollinator plants. Even if they're outside, my pollinators really aren't going to be visiting them. Really, the only insects that I'm going to see on my tropicals outside are going to be plant damaging insects. So on my tropicals, I really like to use this uh, systemic houseplant. Um, super easy, you sprinkle it on the top of the soil, you water it in, repeat monthly. This is gonna take care of uh, mealybugs, it's gonna take care of spider mites, um, it's gonna take care of a lot of the stuff that we see on our tropicals. Doesn't do a lot for fungal gnats, that's kind of a different treatment, but this will take care of the the insects that are actively eating your leaves and your stems. Um, for my outside plants, I exclusively use beneficial insects. Again, I am putting them out twice a month during the growing season, whether I'm seeing bugs, plant damaging insects or not. If I'm having an infestation, I use the Be Safe. This is a topical treatment. As long as you are not applying it directly to a pollinator, it is 100% pollinator safe. It's essentially sesame oil. It smothers the body of the mealybugs, of the aphids, of the spider mites, and kills them in that way. Um, it basically means that they can no longer transpire or respire, they can't breathe anymore. Um, I use this exclusively outside. Um, 
I just get the hose in sprayer because again, I'm very lazy and this is the easiest thing for me to do. I hook my hose up to it. I spray everything down. If I'm having an infestation, I call it done. Um, if y'all do decide to go this route, I recommend getting the hose in sprayer bottle. And then this is a concentrate. Um, so you can just refill as needed. This can be refilled as many times as until it breaks, I guess, until it cracks or something. So this is, if I had, and this is only for an infestation. This is, I have a plant, it is literally covered with aphids, it's literally covered with mealy bud, bugs. I'm going to initially treat the infestation with this. I'm always gonna follow up with my bene beneficial insects. Always, always, always. Um, weak and dying plants. So um, plants that are stressed, plants that are weak, plants that are damaged for some reason and are just having a hard time coming back are much more susceptible to plant damaging insects than a healthy plant. Um, this has to do with pheromones. <laughs> this has to do with all kinds of chemicals that are being released by that plant that effectively entice the plant damaging insects to that plant. Um, my biggest thing is get it out of there. If you're struggling with a plant, again, if this plant is weak or dying, pull it out because it is going to attract those plant damaging insects, which will in turn damage your healthy plants. Um, so I am kind of ruthless when it comes to those decisions. Um, I don't have much patience for, for weak or dying plants. They're just gone. <laughs> that's easier to take care of. Um, something that I'm not gonna struggle with so much. Um, that's just me. <laughs> I don't expect anybody else to really subscribe to that, but it does make everything a lot easier. Um, that way I'm not having to coddle something. I'm not having to really work hard to get this one plant that I'm probably gonna lose anyway to come back while I'm attracting those plant damaging insects to my other healthy plants. Sacrifice one to save the rest kind of deal. Um, just get them out of there. Um, so, like I said, I am a wildlife rehabilitator. So 2020, that was the year of the murder hornets. So we have a wasp here in Texas. It's called a cicada, cicada, cicada killer wasp. They are freaking giant. I mean, like giant, giant. I cannot tell you how many calls I got at my rescue. Hey, I have a murder hornet. Hey, I have a, because that was also a huge cicada year. We had tons of cicadas that year. So these cicada killer wasps were everywhere. So if you're ever seeing a giant wasp, A, they don't care about you. They know they can't eat you. They're not going to try unless you try to attack them. They will defend themselves. Just leave them alone. But if you ever see one, take some pictures. They are so cool. Um, they are so cool and they're so big. It's one of the biggest wasps I've ever seen in my life. It's not a murder hornet. I promise it is not a murder hornet. It's just going after cicadas. Um, this is the green lacewing larva. I knew I had a picture of it somewhere. Again, that is like a science fiction monster and I love it so much. Um, but you can see that it's eating this aphid here um, very efficiently. Thank you. Um, and then don't forget our, about our spiders. Um, they're also, we were talking about mantis earlier. Um, spiders are also gonna really help you control those bigger plant damaging insects, um, specifically grasshoppers, um, orb weavers, so near and dear to my heart. Um, they can wrap up a giant grasshopper in a matter of seconds. Um, so yeah, don't, don't chase all of them away. They're doing really good things too. We love spiders. Even the not so great ones, we still love them. Okay, so that is the end of the slides throw. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna kind of walk through, I have some plants here that are notorious for having issues. Um, anyone has ever had, I'm gonna start with my indoor stuff. If anyone has ever had a palm, I can guarantee you, you have had problems with spider mites. 
that's just what happens. Unfortunately, there's not a good solution other than it just happens with the exception of the systemic. This, again, this is what I'm gonna use on all my tropicals. That palm is not gonna bloom. It's not going to attract my pollinators. I'm not worried about using a systemic in there. If I do it regularly, it is going to prevent any future infestations in that plant. Yes. Okay, so the question was, is it harmful for dogs? I don't know exactly, but I would bet it is. Um, so uh, just be really, it's, it's essentially poison. I hate using that word because it is just a treatment. It's a chemical treatment, but I would be really careful about uh, pets getting into it. Um, I have giant idiot cats and dogs. My cats are like 20 pounds, my dogs are like 100 pounds. They are giant idiots. Um, they get into quite a lot. Um, I just make sure that if I'm using a systemic on anything, that plant is out of their reach. So it's either up on a shelf where they can't get to it, it is in a room where they don't really have access, um, I just have to do a little more work to make sure that they're safe. However, most of my tropicals are toxic to cats and dogs anyway, um, so I'm already kind of in that routine of making sure that they don't have access to it. Um, so I would just be careful, just a little bit of uh, supervision, I, guess, I don't know. Um, so systemic for houseplants, again, palms notorious for spider mites. Alocasias, I love them so much. I love them so much. Um, I have never had one that survived for very long. It's gonna be spider mites, it's gonna be mealybugs. They also require a lot of water and I'm gonna say it like a million times, I am very, very lazy. I do not want to put in the effort to take care of this plant no matter how pretty it is. But these guys, if you ever go home with an alocasia, you should be going home with systemic as well. You will need it it will happen, there is no question. Um, but they are just, they're so pretty. Um, Calatheas are another spider mite magnet. Um, again, I love these plants. If I go home with one, I definitely treat it as a temporary uh, plant. I enjoy it while it looks good, and then it's gone. Um, because I know it's gonna crash, because I just don't have the motivation to take care of it. It's not a hard plant, it just does have some very specific requirements that I'm not willing to meet. Um, but these guys are spider mite magnets. So again, if you're going home with a Calathea, get that systemic, get it in when you're repotting, cut the problem off before it's a problem. Um, so hibiscus, this came off the truck with a little bit of caterpillar damage. Um, so I think everyone can see kind of the holes that are on some of these leaves. This is a perfectly healthy plant. I'm not worried about this plant surviving. I'm not worried about this plant, you know, crashing at any point. It's, at this point, it's more aesthetics. Um, and again, that kind of goes into the thought process of, being part of an ecosystem and having both the good and the bad all the time. Um, I told you I love cannas, my grasshoppers eat them. My mantis do a really good job of keeping the grasshopper population down, but they don't eliminate it. Again, if they did, my mantis would have no reason to stay in my yard because there's nothing for them to eat. So I can deal with a little bit of aesthetics, you know, compromise on that part I can deal with that. If you can't, that's okay too. That's totally okay too. But this is, hibiscus are kind of notorious for caterpillar damage. These are really toothsome leaves. If I was a caterpillar, I would want to eat this. Um, very nutritious and very filling for them. <laughs> Absolutely, it's so cool. <laughs> My house is a little insane. Um, okay. So this is another tropical that I did want to point out specifically because of the shape of the leaves. Um, these guys can be really prone to mealybugs. Sorry, let me just get this off. Um, because the shape of the leaf provides so much shelter. So I don't know if everyone can see how tightly curled these leaves are. There's all kinds of pockets where insects, plant damaging insects, can hide in here. 
Um, I love these guys too. They really are easy to care for. I do have these at home because I can neglect and ignore them. Um, <laughs> it's, I've tried. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yes, um, Hoyas are great, but any plant at all, inside, outside, I don't care what plant it is, if it has these really, really tight, curly leaves um, that have a lot of space for plant damaging insects to hide, just plan, just have it in your head. You will eventually have an insect issue that needs to be addressed. Hoyas do bloom. This is kind of my exception to my systemic rule. However, it takes years for a Hoya to bloom. If I ever get any of mine to bloom, I'm going to be wearing a shirt that says my Hoya bloomed. I'm going to write it on my forehead. Like, I'm going to tell everybody and make everyone look at pictures. Um, so I would probably do a systemic with this while it's young. As soon as it's approaching two or three years old, I'm probably going to switch over from the systemic to my beneficial insect and bee safe regimen so that I'm not potentially harming uh, pollinators by having that systemic insecticide in there. Again, this is one of the exceptions to a blooming tropical. Um, but anytime you're going to see leaves like this, plan on having some kind of plant damaging insect issue in the future um, because it's, it's just going to happen. Um, so Jerusalem sage, one of my favorite plants. I have a ton of it. These guys can be a little prone to mealy bugs. And I don't know like scientifically if this is right, but my theory is is because they have these really soft, tender stems and leaves that make it very, very easy for mealybugs to um, lay their eggs in. It also makes it very, very easy for mealybugs to eat. This is a blooming pollinator plant. I'm not going to do systemics on this. I am going to turn to my bee safe if I'm having an active infestation and I'm going to do my preventative with my beneficial insects. Um, the other thing that I really, I oh, mean, squash. I brought a flat of squash. Again, I love these and I love growing them. They will just vine everywhere. The flowers are beautiful and delicious. And yeah, I, I love them, but I've been heartbroken too many times. So essentially what happens is, every, can everyone see how thick these stems are? they are essentially hollow on the inside. So what happens is the adult lays, pierces the outer skin of the vine itself, lays the eggs directly inside. That's where the eggs hatch, that's where the larva emerges, and that's where the larva eats. It literally eats that plant from the inside out. So again, you don't have a lot of recourse there. By the time you realize that you're dealing with squash borers, often it's too late to really do anything about it because they have literally damaged the whole plant. Um, if I do grow these, I am growing them purely for ornamental. I'm not expecting a harvest from them. I will be um, surprised and very happy if it happens, but I'm not, I'm going in with expectations that are realistic for me. So not as much, um, and I, they do. So no, it's really going to be in the squash family. Watermelons are another one that they can really get into. It's mainly in the squash and gourd family though. So pumpkins, any kind of zucchini, any kind of squash, that's going to be really susceptible to it. Um, when I start seeing a problem, I just pull it out <laughs> and be done with it. So even though last year that we had growth going on. Okay. Totally, yeah. Plan on eating it. Yeah. <laughs> and if you've got enough room, these will take up a lot of room. I don't know if everybody in here has grown squash, but you got to allow them a lot of room to vine and go all over the place, um, which I kind of like. Aesthetically, yeah, they climb on things. Um, I like that aesthetically, but as soon as I know that I've got borers in there, I'm just going to pull it out. It's really unfortunate um, but this is also you know part of the system I wish I had a better answer than that but it really just kind of is part of gardening um, I w when I rule the world squash borers will still exist but they won't be 
so lethal to squash plants. They'll just be like a hitchhiker, Literary like a friend. Do they, I remember, like, so, no, they turn, it's more of a beetle-like. Okay. Um, so they're long and skinny. So I would say an adult squash borer, if you took a, an assassin bug and a beetle and smush them together, that's kind of what an adult squash borer looks like. But the larva is very grub-like. It looks like a larva. Yeah. <laughs> it, it totally looks like a larva. Um, okay, so the one other thing that I really wanted to touch base on, so I did mention um, weak, damaged, dying plants are going to be more susceptible to plant-damaging insect infestations. So I make sure that my health, the health of my plant is as important as my treatment for any infestations I, I have. That all starts in the soil. Again, soil could not exist without insects. Um, but I focus on the soil to make sure that my plant is going to stay as healthy as it can so that I'm less likely to deal with an infestation of plant damaging insects. That comes from a variety of things. Um, compost, we've got some compost over there up here. That's going to add a very um, healthy microbiome to your soil. That is something that I do twice a year. I do it at the beginning of the spring and the beginning of the fall, um, just so that I know that I have really nice active soil. Um, this bio inoculant essentially triggers anything stale in your soil. So over time, nutrients get locked up, um, they get used. This is gonna really trigger anything that may be dormant in your soil to come back alive. Um, this humates, this purple bag, that is pelleted concentrated compost. So easy. If you've got already really healthy soil, but you feel like you just need it to give it a little oomph, the Humates is the way to go. It's a quarterly application. Again, it's little pellets. It's a slow release. You just spread it out, water it in, and you're done. Um, really, really easy. Again, I'm very, very lazy. So the Humates is amazing. The other thing that I do, I'm not great about fertilization. I will never pretend that I am. The one thing that I do consistently all the time is seaweed. So liquid seaweed, when I'm explaining this to anybody, it's not a food, it's a supplement. It's akin to us taking vitamin C. It's really just going to kind of boost the inner immunity of the plant. It's going to act as a root stimulator, which in turn is going to make the above ground, if your roots are super healthy, your above the ground plant growth is going to be super healthy. I do this every time I water, um, year round. Uh, it is honestly the thing that allows me to be as lazy as I am. Um, if I didn't have this, I would be struggling constantly. Um, and I probably wouldn't do a lot of plants. Um, so if seaweed is not already in your regimen, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, honestly, one of the easiest things you can do, it's two ounces per gallon of water. You just put it into your watering can and water like normal. You can put it in a hose end sprayer for foliar application for large areas. It really is easy and one of the best things that you can do for your plants. I do this every watering. Okay. The Humates is gonna be a quarterly application, yeah. So I do, I do seaweed every watering. Um, you would really have to make a conscious effort to overdo it with this stuff. You would have to take like the entire bottle unconcentrated and pour it onto a plant to have any adverse effects. This is going to do nothing but good things for your plants. Um, the other thing, if you don't really want to do the granular bioinoculant, um, this is the same thing as the liquid seaweed. I believe it's two ounces per gallon of water. Yep. Um, and then you just water like normal. It's going to do the same thing. It's really going to wake up what's in the soil and maybe locked up, maybe dormant. Um, it's going to get that soil active again so that the roots have access to all of that activity in the soil and the microbiome, which in turn is going to make your plant healthier which in that turn is going to make it more plant damaging, insect resistant. Stronger your plant, the better chance it's gonna have of surviving some kind of infestation. 
This guy, so I really do this, if I'm doing a liquid, I'm probably gonna do this once a month. If I'm doing a granular, I'm gonna do that quarterly because it's a slow release. Um, pretty much anytime you're doing a liquid that is immediately available to plant roots. Anything granular, it is going to have to dissolve a little bit before it is available for the plant to actually use, which is why the humates and the bio inoculant are great quarterly applications because it will slowly break down and slowly release into the soil over that entire quarter. This is going to be much faster. It's going to be used by the plant faster, so you do need to repeat application a little bit more. I wouldn't do it more than once a month. And honestly, if you've got a really, if you've done your compost, if you've got a really healthy soil to start with, you've got that nice um, foundation for your plants, you're not gonna have to do this very often because you're already addressing all of those things. You're adding compost, you know, you're adding that microorganism bank back to your soil again. Um, so yeah, the, the more you're amending and taking care of your soil and ensuring that it's healthy and active, the less you're gonna have to do things like this that's going to wake up what might be inactive. Does that help? Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would probably so I treat the bio inoculant more like compost. Yeah. The humates I'm going to do yeah. quarterly. Yeah. Compost. If I'm just adding compost in twice a year, I'm probably going to go ahead and include that bio inoculant with it twice a year. I'm not going to do it much more than that. Again, if I'm starting with healthy soil, there's really not a lot that I need to be doing besides maintaining that healthy soil. And that that's done by adding compost. That's done by adding worms so that we know that we're making sure that, that our soil is aerated. Their worm poop is like plant gold. So if you've got a nice... Um, if you've got a nice worm population in your soil, that means your soil is already pretty healthy. The worms would not be there if they could not make it through the soil. If there were not teeny tiny things for them to eat, they eat like microorganisms, um, they would not be there if your soil wasn't already healthy. So if you're digging and you're seeing a bunch of worms, amazing. If you're digging and you see no worms, you need some worms. Um, you need to address the health of your soil and you need to get some worms added in there. Um, this is from a local company, Austin Worm Lab. He comes and takes care of them regularly, but they're, I love worms. Gotcha. Gotcha. Sure. Sure. So that question was like, how much is a lot of worms? So if I'm digging, let's say I'm just gonna start with like two by two. So if I'm doing like a two square foot area, I'm expecting to see a couple of worms. If I'm doing a four by eight area, I'm expecting to see 10, 20 worms um, as I'm digging. Are you not seeing that many? Okay. No. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Sure. I'm just going to leave you alone. Yeah, totally, totally. So next time you're digging, just look. Even if you're not, if, yeah, well, even if you're, yeah, even if you're ignoring them and trying to avoid them, as long as you're seeing that they're there, I wouldn't worry too much about it. If you were digging a four by eight foot bed and you're not seeing a single worm in there anywhere, I would really start troubleshooting with my soil. Okay. I think you should be fine. Because I, I think you should be fine especially if you're not actively looking for them. I actively look for them. Like, where are all the worms? <laughs> so, yeah, so what you would do, so these come... Um, are they going to migrate off 
so these come in like a substrate. So what I would do is I would, uh, sorry, I won't show you. Um, <laughs> Yes, yeah, so these are actually live red worms. Um, so if I was going to try to incorporate this container into my garden, I would loosen up the top maybe inch or two of soil, um, distribute this kind of evenly across the entire area, and then honestly, I'm just going to use my fingers and kind of rough, and kind of rough it up and water it in so that they have their moisture and then their instinct is to go down their instinct is to go into the soil i'm not worried about them escaping my bed if i have provided them with healthy soil that has food i'm providing them with water and i'm providing them with shelter which is the soil itself again food water shelter everything that lives needs those things I would probably include, so this is 50 worms. I would do a whole container. If I'm not seeing any worms at all, I would do a whole container per four by eight. Um, if I already know that I have kind of a worm population, I may just supplement this throughout parts of my yard. Even put it in potted plants. You know, if you've got potted plants outside, um, put it in compost. They do a great job of breaking down compost. If No, 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 not at all. This will kill them if you spray it directly on them. This will kill them no matter what, because once you add it, it's in the soil too. And it has a certain amount of time before it breaks down and it's no longer present. Um, but as long as I'm doing an organic approach and I'm not using anything systemic, I'm not worried about the health of these guys at all. Um, yes. That's ama an amazing thing. So the question was mushrooms um, and whether or not it's good. That is an amazing thing. So for all intents and purposes here, anytime you're seeing mold on the top of your soil or you're seeing a high fungal um, population where you're seeing a lot of mushrooms sprout up, that is usually a really good sign. That means that you have a very active, alive soil. That means you have your substrate is doing great. So if you're seeing a lot of mushrooms, if you're seeing the white mold, if you're seeing black mold, let's have a different discussion. But if you're seeing white mold just kind of growing on the top of soil, that means your soil is effectively composting as you're watching it. Um, so that is nothing to be concerned or alarmed about same thing so that just means like if you're seeing mushrooms or mold on like the top of a potted plant like this um, that just means that your soil is really healthy and that it's comp actively composting um, in that that container yeah so again if it's black mold take some pictures let's have a conversation if it's not black mold I'm not worried about it at all Aesthetically, I may not like it. So if it's bothering you, you know, you could always put, scrape some out, but then you're really kind of defeating the purpose of having healthy soil because that mold is indeed helping that soil be healthy and remain healthy. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Yes. So I think it happens in most areas. Sure. Like I'm in my garden, so most areas are common. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Except our Sure. Okay. Um, but if it is happening, does that mean kind of like the whole area of yard has potential? Uh, yes and no. Um, I would imagine it's happening in the mulched areas more because it's n the mulched areas are being disturbed less. Um, in your garden beds, you know, I know in my garden bed, I'm constantly turning soil over. I'm adding things. I'm watering. I'm doing all of this stuff. So it is essentially constantly being disturbed in a pathway or in an, just a mulched like bed that doesn't really see much activity, there's more time for that to remain stationary and for it to really start that composting pro uh, process. Um, so it sounds like you've got a pretty good setup. You're seeing worms. I mean, things are going 
things are growing yeah totally so I wouldn't be too concerned about it but yeah if you're seeing like white mold growing on the mulch pass that literally just means that mulch is composting itself which is nothing but good yeah and then you just add more mulch when it's all composted you just add more to it Mm -hmm. And I sell all kinds of environmental sure. and very rarely you'll see like really brush damage. I mean you might see like some corners get like red stains. Mm -hmm. But I have used I think I have the um mulch mm -hmm. but I haven't used that. But when I use pot, I usually take the old cans or sure. compost seeds. So that's not a good idea. So it depends on how long you're waiting before doing this. So this stuff is going to be out of the soil and out of the plant system in roughly a month, oh, okay. which is why I'm applying it every month so that I know that I'm having constant coverage. Um, so if, as long as you're waiting about that long, I wouldn't be overly concerned about it. Um, you know, I have, y'all are gonna totally judge me for this. I have a, a graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> where I've had like potted plants that haven't made it and I just kind of put the pot with the old soil over there and I just kind of let it sit until I have the motivation to actually do something with it which could be you know a week or like six months I don't know um sure yeah yeah and that's I think if we're trying to do gardening rigidly by the book, I think you're just setting yourself up for failure because the by the book method really doesn't account for a living organism that does have a mind of its own every once in a while. You know, so again, that's why I really emphasize you can't have good insects without bad insects ever. I think you learned that firsthand by having lace wings. I'm, I would bet money that they hatched and they moved on because there wasn't anything to eat. Um, you know, they would have stayed, they would likely have stayed had they had some aphids and a water source. Um, but you just, you can't account for everything. And you know, if you, if you are approaching gardening to have the picture perfect, you know, hydrangeas in the front yard and, you know, all of this beautiful manicured lawn. That is so much work. That is so much work. That is daily maintenance that you are having to do. Instagram lies to you constantly, y'all. Constantly. No one has perfect plants. I don't care if they're inside. I don't care if they're outside. You will always have yellow leaves. You will always have insects to deal with. You will always have something happening that you're like, I don't know what's happening. And I don't know if it's survivable or not. I'm going to do what I can. If it doesn't, then I'll get something that I know will. Um, so I definitely approach it as, hey, I'm entering a system that's already in place, and I need to learn how to work within that system to have results that I'm okay with. I just want to make sure I'm familiar. <laughs> I just want to know the days of those where you're simply sitting down and had a bed of squash and all of a sudden somebody takes a seed and drops it mm -hmm. in the soil. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's and it's so fun to do that. Um, one of my favorite things about gardening, besides all the insects that I get to play with all the time, um, is how unpredictable it is. Uh, seeds are a great example of that. I throw seeds down all year long. I have a bunch of seeds sprouting right now. I have no idea what they are. I put them out like months ago. I have no. I threw those seed packets away the day I planted them. I have no idea what they are. Um, but it's kind of like finding an old roll of film. It's a surprise when it comes up and you don't really know what to expect. So I really, I do encourage people to kind of approach it as like, hey, I'm entering a system. How can I work best within the system that's already created so that I can still get results that I want? Um, but yeah, that's, seeds are so fun. They're so fun. They do all kinds of things. 
Okay, so we are a little bit over, as we tend to do. If y'all have not been to a class before, it never, ever ends at noon. Um, how's everybody feeling? Does anybody need clarification on anything? Yes. For fungal gnats, that's going to be mosquito bits. So I don't have any of that up here right now. Um, so there are these teeny tiny little beige like pellets, essentially. I let it sit in my watering. I just put a handful in my watering can. I have a two-gallon watering can. I do maybe, I'm going to tell you to read the directions. I do roughly the, what they, it tells me to do. Um, I let that sit in my watering can for about 30 minutes, and then I just water as normal. So that's going to take care of the eggs and the larva that's in the soil. The adults are going to be, it's a two-pronged effect so, or approach. You're going to deal with the adults at the same time that you're dealing with the, the larva and the eggs. So the little yellow sticky things, if it's an indoor plant, those work really well. Um, I've had tremendous success with just getting a little mason jar the cheapest sweetest red wine you can find like dollar store cheap wine put a teeny tiny bit in the bottom with a just drop or two of dawn um, saran wrap poke a few holes in the top so that they can get in they essentially are attracted to that liquid because it's sweet and sugary they get stuck and then you've dealt with the the adults while you're simultaneously dealing with the eggs and the larvae that are in the soil with the mosquito bits um, because you don't want to just deal with the eggs and the larvae because you've still got adults flying around that as soon as you've dealt with these eggs and larvae, the adults are still there to repeat the process. So I always do it in a two-pronged. Fungal gnats are the bane of every houseplant person's existence. Sometimes they're not an issue. Sometimes you have cycles where they're just flying into your face, in your mouth, in your eyes constantly. Um, unfortunately that's just kind of that's that's part of it sometimes you're not going to have any problems sometimes you're going to have nothing but problems um but the mosquito bits work really well for me um but again like the sticky tr the sticky things i really try not to use because again they're indiscriminate anything that touches it is going to get stuck and die while I kind of want that for my fungal gnats if I have a spider or a lizard or something that is actually eating those fungal gnats you know I don't want to put them at risk so I tend to do the wine um, because it is a little more discriminant spiders really aren't going to be attracted to it um, so that work that's a method that works really well for me with this guy absolutely this guy can go in everything it can be on every single plant that has ever existed cactus succulents fruits and vegetables tropicals you name it this stuff is going to do nothing but good things for it yeah again it's the only thing that i do right the only thing that i do right <laughs> so love it love it love it and i will always do it okay any other questions everybody feeling good about bugs Okay, everyone go dig in your dirt for worms. Cursory count. You don't have to do an active count. Um, but, and I do hope that, you know, everyone leaves this class feeling like they understand the insect world a little bit better and how to work within it versus against it. You have a much better chance of winning if you're working within it than if you're trying to fight it constantly. Okay? And always ask me for bug questions. Um, maybe next time we'll have the uh, aphid giving birth to a pregnant aphid. It's so crazy. It's so crazy, y'all. Maybe I'll have our marketing put it on the uh, Instagram or whatever. Oh, right good! That's place. right. Just move I them right over. Lived all winter long. I have a fennel that's yeah. five years old. Yeah. I have no idea. I don't, I don't do anything to it. There you go. Yeah, y'all have fun. I can't grow anything in the, um, I live in a condo. Uh -huh. with by checking the environment. You're welcome. Um, and he goes, what's that? And I said, that's my cowslip. And he looked like, and he 
goes, well, in that area that doesn't grow anything, why don't you just plant parsley and I said, there's an idea. There we go. <laughs> you could do the whole parsley, fit like that whole family. Yeah. Um, you could do dill, you could do fennel, you could do parsley, and that way you're not having a, a mono, you know, culture. Yeah, the only thing with dill is that it goes all over yeah. when it's here. Sure, now, yeah. And so I yeah. want it to in like the back of my sure. garden. So if I do those caterpillars, I'm going to plant them in there. There you go. There you go. And they're so pretty. Yeah. Yeah. After Hi. Class, yes, absolutely. Yeah, you said uh, in the after class to talk about the squash. Yes. I <laughs> okay. Squash squash. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I have had seasons where I have mm -hmm. grown squash successfully without dealing with borers. Mm -hmm. I've had just as many seasons where I have grown them unsuccessfully because of borers. You've always had. Un uh, but I'm, I'm in a different spot right now. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, so the biggest treatment for squash borers is going to be BT. Um, that's, we have it in our apothecary. I can walk you through that. Okay. That does have a um, potential to go systemic. Okay. So because the squash flowers so beautifully, it's not a huge pollinator attractant, but it is going to attract some pollinators, mainly beetles, mm -hmm. um, big things that can climb into those flowers. Um, so you've got that option and that will combat them. Um, it's really how, how much effort are you wanting to put into it? Yeah. I'm, at a, I'm at Sunshine Community Garden. Oh, gotcha, okay. Yeah, so I think, I think they're not allowed to be systemic. Uh, yeah, I would imagine yeah. um, they have. So I would actually look at their list. Okay. I mean, especially if they have like an approved and disapproved list of products mm -hmm. before I send you home with something, mm -hmm. I want to make sure it's something that you're actually going to be able to use. Mm -hmm. um, so the beneficial insects will deal with the adult squash borers that are actively laying eggs. Okay. Like a mantis is great at combating yeah. those adults. Mm -hmm. Um, again, it's not going to do anything for the larva once mm -hmm. it's in the vine, but you could at least start attacking the adult population so mm -hmm. that there's fewer eggs laid. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I haven't put any in yet. Gotcha. Okay. So BT, uh, yeah. I would check and just make sure it's on their approved list. It has a very low chance, okay. but there is still is a, a slight risk. Mm -hmm. um, so I would double, again, I don't want to send you home with something mm -hmm. that you get there and realize that you can't actually use it. Um, so check their list, see what's approved. I bet they, so BT is one of the oldest and most well-known products for squash borers and caterpillars and all kinds of stuff. Um, anything chewing, um, it's and a long tried favorite for a lot of people. So uh, sunshine may, it may be fine mm -hmm. for you to use it there because again, there is a fairly low risk of it impacting okay. pollinators. So I wouldn't count it out immediately, okay. but if I was sending you home with a product for squash borers, it would be BT. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, if they have a list of approved and unapproved products, I would just like, if you were in an HOA, mm -hmm. I would, want you to do to know what plants you can get mm -hmm. before sending you home with a bunch of plants that you may or may not be able to plant okay. so um yeah i want you to be effective from the get-go not having to make 50 million trips to get the right yeah. thing because yeah. there's this list of ineligible products okay. yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so bt is what i would be sending you home with okay. if you knew for a fact that you could use it yeah um so check with them We've got squash on the floor. If you're ready to do it, by all means, yeah. go home with some. Um, and I also tend to, when I, the years that I had most success, mm -hmm. I planted a lot. Yeah. So while I did have some fatalities, mm -hmm. I still had enough that made it where I was still able to harvest. However, because of the size of these plants, unless you've got just a ton of space, it's gonna be really hard to do a mass planting mm -hmm. and hope for the odds to work in your favor. Yeah. Does yeah. that kind of make sense? Yeah, okay. It's big, but okay. It's still not like I mean, you could probably, how big is it? <laughs> okay, no, that's yeah. fine. I mean, I don't know how big those, we were actually there for the, the plant sale and mm -hmm. I don't know how big the plots were. 
I mean, if it's four by eight, you think it's bigger than that? Okay, so maybe like five by 10. You could probably get away with two to three mm -hmm. if you're really strategic in your planting um, and you're kind of directing the vines as they're growing. You could still plant stuff around the vines, um, but you'd have to be a little strategic and think about it. I wouldn't try to do more than three, and I think three may even be pushing it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I always plant expecting to lose something. Yeah. It's, you know, I buy three. I'm going to be happy if one makes it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I um I did. I'm doing like half of it as a cover crop. Just oh, cool. Clover. Cool. Um. So I was like, oh, maybe if the soil is better. I sure. Yeah. yeah. It all starts with soil. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're, it's just like building a house. If you've got a a bad foundation, that house is never going to be stable. Yeah. Same thing with soil. If you're starting with really, you know easy way out soil it's you're gonna have nothing but problems yeah yeah, yeah. Well, thank you my pleasure thank you for coming yeah. i'll be here next week too all right yeah. all the classes yeah. hi um, so i'm really new to this i just wanted to take the class to get sure to learn. um so i'm interested in having like an outdoor thing okay i'm in a pretty small area okay my backyard doesn't have much so i was thinking of getting something like the freight sure I don't, yeah I don't Sure. Um, I want to plant a vegetable and herb. Okay. I read online that pairing two together, like a tomato and a basil, would be really good. So yeah. So uh, most all plants are going to do a little bit, bit different things within the soil. Um, some fix nitrogen, which make it readily available for like beans or nitrogen fixers. So. The, um, the Native American trio was corn, beans, and squash. Um, all of those things combined fixed the nitrogen in the soil, provided all the plants with the nutrients that they needed. So yes, there is a ton of truth in plant pairings. Um, all for it, mm -hmm. I say. And again, that, that goes into the diversity. The more diverse garden you have, the more successful it's going to be um, because monoculture is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, so, and tomato and basil, what can't you eat those on True. that's not delicious? Yeah. Um, how big is your space? I don't know. Like don't bigger than this table? Um, well, it's a backyard. But oh, I gotcha. Okay. Like, I don't know what I would put in, like I have like a trash bin. Gotcha. So it's kind of like this okay. big. Herbs and veggies would do great in there. Okay, Let's cool. get you set. Do you have any pictures? I, no. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, actually, let I'm me get my walkie-talkie real fast. Well, I can at least go ahead and get you, you know, a plan while you're here, so that at least you have, you can, you can take some things home with you to learn about. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. Can I get a salesperson to the center aisle to help a guest with outdoor small container planting? All right, let's go this way. I'll be right there. Perfect. So Leo's going to get you all set up. He's also a, um, sorry, he also knows a ton about, uh, he's our urban veggie uh, guy, so he's going to be able to get you all kinds of, all kinds of information. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for letting me nerd about about nerd out about bugs. They're my favorite. Okay, new. Are you new to Texas or just new to gardening? Okay, welcome. It's going to be a roller coaster. Okay. <laughs> so interested. So you've you've got a trough, like a raised bed trough. Um, interested in maybe some herbs and veggies. Okay. Awesome. First time. Yeah. Have so much fun. And don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. We're always here to help. Gotcha. <laughs> no. Maybe in a potted arrangement. Oh, I'm sorry. That looks fine. Hi. I'm disconnecting everything.